Hello, my fellow investors, and welcome back to another video. Today, guys, I'm going to do something a little bit special. I want to take a look at, once again, the company Nike. Now, if you guys remember, I just took a look at this company a little bit ago, but I want to do something a little bit different because I am half tempted to buy this company tomorrow on, or when you guys see this today, for about 100 shares or so. So an, an entire call option here. And, well, I would like to show everybody where I'm kind of leaning to and like what I may end up doing depending on how things open up tomorrow and then my final conclusion overall. Now, if you guys see this video, you guys are going to see that it's very long, but it's because it has two articles that we're going to read. One that is showing a buy and then the other one showing a hold. I'm not going to be reading it. It'll be the audio from Seeking Alpha. So if you guys would just like to put a double speed, you absolutely can. And then after that, we're going to take a look at my observation when it comes to it, my discount of free cash flow, and my final decision whether or not I sh I'm looking to buy into this company. But before we get started, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, really does help with the algorithm on YouTube. As well as well, make sure to follow us on XFL Investing, which you like to join us on Discord, which is the best way to get the shorts, live streams, and videos. The link is in the description below. So with that said, let's get started with this video. So let's just get right into the two articles that I listened to showing a buy and a hold. So right now I'm going to go skip right to that. And well, again, you guys can double speed it if you would like. The first one's 15 minutes and it's for a buy. So here we go. Nike is struggling, but might be a buy already. This article was written by Daniel Schoenberger. Summary. Nike's stock, previously rated as a sell due to high valuation, has declined 37% since 2020, making its valuation multiples more reasonable. Despite recent revenue and earnings declines, Nike's long-term fundamentals remain strong, with a wide economic moat and consistent performance. Analysts expect Nike's bottom line to grow at a cager of 9.09% over the next decade, supported by market share gains and share buybacks. Given its current valuation and strong support levels, Nike is now rated as a cautious buy for long-term investors. My last article about Nike Inc. NKE was published four years ago in October 2020, and back then I rated the stock as a sell. And among the nearly 800 articles I have written in last eight years, there are only a few companies and stocks I rated as a sell. In the article, I wrote the following conclusion. Don't get me wrong, Nike is a great business. But the question is, if we should buy the stock right now or if we should wait a few months or quarters and hope for lower prices. Nike is trading for extremely high valuation multiples and also seems to be overvalued when using a discount cash flow analysis. And especially short-term oriented investors might probably buy at the wrong time. And in the first few quarters after my sell rating, the stock continued to increase. And it was certainly possible to argue that I got it wrong and did underestimate Nike. But in late 2021, the stock peaked around $180. And since summer 2022, the stock is now trading at a lower price or at best the same price compared to the point when my last article was published. At the time of writing, the stock has declined 37% since the article was published. And the logical question now seems, is Nike cheap enough to be a buy? again. In the following article, we will examine Nike from different perspectives, including valuation multiples, which became more reasonable. We look at the chart and we look at fundamentals and growth potential in the years to come. We start by looking at the valuation multiples. Valuation multiples. Nike was one of those companies rated as sell due to the extremely high stock price. Or to be more precise, the stock price was extremely high in comparison to the fundamental business, which resulted in very high valuation multiples for the stock. However, since its all-time high, Nike declined almost 60%, and this steep decline also had an impact on the P.E. ratio and P.F.C.F. ratio, especially as the fundamental business continued to perform well. We will get to this. At the time of writing, the stock is trading for 22 times earnings and 16 times free cash flow. When looking at the last 10 years, the stock is now trading for the lowest valuation multiples. We can argue that 22 times earnings is still not an extreme bargain, but considering the high quality of Nike's business, we will get to this, is making the stock also not expensive at this point. 
and 16 times free cash flow for a business that has a wide economic moat and is growing with a solid pace and high levels of consistency, at least the top line. Seems certainly justified and might already deserve the label bargain. But let's first look at the quarterly results and the long-term solid performance before we return to an intrinsic value calculation at the end. Quarterly results. We could argue that Nike's stock price declined mostly due to the high valuation that was not justified anymore, and investors got more cautious. But we can also look at the last quarterly results, and the declining top and bottom line was also not helpful for the business. October 1, 2024, Nike reported first quarter results, and while the business did beat expectations for earnings per share, it missed revenue expectations slightly. When looking at the numbers in comparison to the same quarter last year, the earnings were rather a disappointment. Revenue declined 10.4% year over year from 12,939 million in Q1 2024 to 11,589 in Q1 2025. Income before income taxes also declined from $1,648 million in the same quarter last year to $1,307 million this quarter, resulting in a decline of 20.7% year over year. And diluted earnings per share also declined from $0.94 cents in Q1 24 to $0.70 cents in Q1 25, a bottom line decline of 25.5% year over year. When looking at the different regions, all four declined but it was especially North America, as well as Europe, Middle East, and Africa struggling, both declined in the low double digits in the first quarter of fiscal 2025. Greater China declined 4% year over year, and Asia Pacific and Latin America declined 7%. Though adjusting for currency exchange rates, the decline was only 2%. And when looking at the different categories, equipment increased revenue 14% year over year to $603 million, while apparel as well as footwear both declined 11% year over year. Solid performance. When looking at the last few years, Nike still performed solid. Revenue on an annual basis has continued to increase, although top line growth in fiscal 2024 was only 0.3% year over year. Earnings per share fluctuated a little more in the last few years, but EPS for fiscal 2024 was still solid and at a similar level as fiscal 2021 and fiscal 2022. Compared to fiscal 2023, the bottom line increased 15.5% year over year. When looking at the earnings revisions in the last few quarters, we see that analysts are constantly getting more pessimistic and assumptions for the next few years are constantly lowered. For example, about three years ago, analysts were still expecting earnings per share for fiscal 2025 to be as high as $6.80. Now analysts are only expecting $2.81 in earnings per share. But while expectations were constantly lowered in the last few years, analysts are still expecting Nike to grow its bottom line in the years to come. Following a decline in fiscal 2025, analysts are expecting double-digit growth rates again and between fiscal 2024 and fiscal 2034, Nike's bottom line is expected to grow with a compound annual growth rate of 9.09%. Different studies expect the apparel market to grow only in the mid-single digits in the years to come. Grandview Research is expecting the global apparel market to grow with a compound annual growth rate of 4.1% until 2030, and the U.S. market to grow only 3.3%. Another study from Mordor Intelligence is a little more optimistic and expecting an annual growth rate of 4.6% for the same time frame. And other studies focusing especially on the sports apparel market are more optimistic and are expecting growth rates of 6.5% annually. If we assume that the overall market will grow only in the mid-single digits and analysts are expecting high single-digit to double-digit growth rates for the bottom line, we must ask where the higher growth rates should come from. One simple answer is by taking market shares from competitors, which seems likely and might actually contribute to higher top-line growth. Share buybacks. Bottom-line growth can also stem from share buybacks, and in the last few decades, management used the tool of share buybacks frequently. In the last 10 years, Nike decreased the number of outstanding shares with a compound annual growth rate of 1.63%. And in the last 20 years, the number of outstanding shares decreased with a compound annual growth rate of 1.81%.
In the last quarter, Nike spent $1.2 billion on share buybacks. And we can assume share buybacks to contribute in a similar way to bottom line growth in the years to come. And about 1.5% to 2% annual growth might stem from share repurchases. By the way, share repurchases are more effective right now. In the last few years, Nike bought back shares for rather high prices as the stock was mostly trading for extremely high valuation multiples. Right now, the company might be able to repurchase about 4% of outstanding shares with the generated free cash flow and still have enough cash to keep the dividend at current levels. Margin improvement. Aside from top-line growth and share buybacks, bottom-line growth can also stem from higher margins and the company being more efficient. But I don't know if we can assume margin improvement in the years to come. Of course, this could be a huge contributor to bottom line growth, but when looking back at the last 30 years, we can describe the gross margin as very stable in the last 20 years, which is a good sign as it is showing pricing power. An operating margin was fluctuating over the last 30 years, but we don't see a clear uptrend. Performance. During recessions, when talking about growth, we should also look at the opposite site and talk about the risk we are seeing for Nike. And one major risk I see for the business in the coming quarter is the looming recession. This is a risk not only Nike is facing, but as a consumer goods company, it is rather cyclical and often reacting to recessions. Nike is mostly selling products which are not essential, and a purchase can sometimes be postponed a few quarters or months. And when looking at data from the last few decades, especially for revenue, earnings per share, and free cash flow, we see the business reacting to recessions in the past. It is not always the same pattern, but we see revenue declining around a recession almost every time. In a potential looming recession, we could see a similar pattern. We already see revenue declining for Nike, and the first quarter results for fiscal 2025, see section above, were certainly not great. And while sales in greater China might improve again in the next few quarters, as the situation in China might overall get better, see my article, Tencent, OTCPA, and Alibaba. For more details, sales in the United States and Europe might come further under pressure, but that is only a temporary decline. Over the long run, I am rather optimistic about Nike growing its business, high quality business. The reason I am long-term optimistic about Nike is very simple. Nike is a high-quality business with a wide economic moat. In my first article about Nike, I described the moat in more detail, which is mostly based on the brand name as well as cost advantages the company has. When looking at the outperformance of Nike versus the S&P 500 during the last four quarters, we see a really impressive outperformance of Nike, which is a strong hint for a wide economic moat around the business. A second major metric we can look at is the return on invested capital, which was above 10% in almost every year since the early 1990s and 20.4% on average in the last three decades and 24.24% on average in the last 10 years. And finally, a stable or improving gross and operating margin is also a strong sign for a wide economic moat. And as I have mentioned above, especially Nike's gross margin is showing strong signs of stability and consistency. All these points make me optimistic about the long-term potential of Nike, as a wide economic moat is leading to pricing power and the ability to fend off competitors. Intrinsic value calculation. I already mentioned above that Nike's valuation multiples declined in the last few quarters, and we can describe the current P.E. ratio and especially P.F.C.F. ratio as reasonable. Additionally, we are using a discount cash flow calculation to determine an intrinsic value for the stock. As always, we are calculating with a 10% discount rate. That is the annual return we like to achieve at least. And the last reported number of diluted outstanding shares, 1,502 million. As a basis, we can use the free cash flow of the last four quarters, and although free cash flow is at an all-time high, I would still see it as a reasonable assumption for Nike. For the next 10 years, I assume similar growth rates as analysts, and we are calculating with 9% growth, followed by 4% growth till perpetuity.
When calculating with these assumptions, we get an intrinsic value of $111.57 for Nike, and the stock could be considered undervalued at this point, and it might even be a bargain, technical picture. When trying to answer the question at which price we should buy Nike, we can also look at the chart. And the stock seems already close to a major support level, but might decline a little lower. For starters, we have the 200-month simple moving average at $64, which is often a strong support and the bottom in a major correction. Additionally, we find the highs of 2015, as well as the lows of December 2018, around $68 generating another strong support level. Finally, around 60 dollars we have got to COVID-19 lows, but that was rather a single spike and maybe not such a strong support level. And Nike already declined close to $70. And therefore, I don't know if the stock will decline much lower again or if it has found its bottom. But between $65 and $70, if the stock should drop there again, we find the buying range. Conclusion. At this point, I certainly must change my rating as Nike is not a sell anymore. I thought long about whether Nike is now a buy or if we should rate it as a hold. But in the end, Nike is trading about 20% below its intrinsic value and seems close to a strong support level, which makes it a cautious buy in my opinion. Of course, Nike is struggling right now and the next few quarters will not be easy for a company that is depending on consumer sentiment. But in the long run, the wide economic moat will lead to high growth rates. And this makes Nike a cautious buy at this point. So as you guys can see, it was uh, really interesting. Now, the fact that they're saying that they're projecting Nike to grow at around 9.09% or around that like 9% kind of margin in the next 10 years is something that I will take into account when I do my discount and free cash flow. As you can see, yes, they do have a big moat. I do agree with that. It's just the headwinds that's a little bit of an issue for me. But now let's take a look at the hold article and see what we can actually learn from this. This article was written by Amritha Roy. Nike's Q1 FY25 earnings report showed a 10% revenue decline and a 26% drop in earnings, driven by lower unit sales and traffic declines. Despite ongoing headwinds, the management is optimistic about performance in the second half, focusing on newness and innovation in performance sports. I have upgraded Nike to a hold rating with a price target of $80 as comps should improve as long as it sticks to its long-term strategic plan of performance sports innovation and powerful storytelling. Hi, I am Amrita Roy, and I write primarily on software stocks. I worked seven years in tech and SF, and I take a fundamentally driven approach to investing with a focus on macroeconomy. Introduction and Investment Thesis. I last covered Nike, NKE, in June, where I initiated a sell rating on the stock after the management projected for sales to decline in the mid-single digits in FY25 as the company refocuses their innovation efforts on performance products, while simultaneously optimizing its product portfolio and reigniting its brand momentum. In the post, I had claimed that given the set of headwinds, the stock's valuation multiple seemed extended, and since then the stock has climbed less than 3%, underperforming the S&P 500. The company reported its Q1 FY25 earnings in early October, where revenue and earnings declined 10% and 26% year-over-year, year, respectively, from lower unit sales across Nike Direct and Nike Wholesale across product categories and geographies. With Elliot Hill transitioning to the role of CEO last month after being at the company for 32 years, the management has withdrawn its FY25 guidance under the leadership of its previous CEO, John Donahoe. While the management expects continued headwinds from its portfolio optimization process, they are slightly more optimistic about performance in the second half of the fiscal year with its newer and more innovative performance sports, contributing a higher share to total revenue. Over the last three months, Nike has faced a slew of downward revisions to revenue and earnings expectations for FY25 and beyond, as there has been growing uncertainty about its growth trajectory, along with macroeconomic and competitive headwinds. However, I believe that if Nike sticks to its long-term plan of driving superior innovation in performance sports while making strategic investments in rebuilding its brand narrative, to resonate with its audience across geographies, along with forming partnerships to expand retail presence, it should face easier comps moving forward. 
which could help stabilize the stock. While the new management has a massive task ahead in turning the fate of the company around, I believe that the downside risk has minimized since my previous write-up. As a result, after assessing both the good and the bad, I have decided to upgrade the stock to a hold rating with a price target of $80. The bad. Weakness across direct, wholesale, and geographies with softness in traffic and portfolio optimization. FY25 guidance withdrawn. Nike reported its Q1 FY25 earnings, where it saw its revenues decline 10% year over year to $11.6 billion, missing analyst estimates, driven by lower unit sales as traffic declines across Nike Direct were more significant than anticipated, along with weakness in their harangue. Wholesale partners requiring higher levels of promotional activity to drive conversion. Meanwhile, the company reported diluted earnings per share of 70 cents, which declined 26% on a year-over-year -year basis. Although Nike reduced its overall SG&A expenses by 2%, driven by lower wage-related expenses, it was not sufficient enough to hold its profit margin steady given the magnitude of the revenue decline. When it comes to Nike Direct, it saw its revenues decline 13% year-over-year to $4.7 billion. This was driven particularly by softness in traffic on Nike Digital that fell 20% on a year-over-year -year basis, while partner stores in Greater China continued to struggle as well. Plus, as Nike continued to take action to shift their product portfolio to create better balance in their business, they intentionally reduced the proportion of their business driven by footwear franchises, such as Air Force One, Air Jordan One, and Dunk, as a result, Nike revenue from these franchises decelerated in Q1 as they tightened marketplace supply. Moving forward, the management outlined that they expect to see declines throughout FY25 for men's and women's lifestyle businesses, as well as the Jordan brand, which were planned down double digits in Q1. Meanwhile, the company also saw weakness across all its geographic segments across the footwear and apparel categories, as can be seen below. Particularly, when it comes to its Chinese market, Nike saw elevated inventory levels in the marketplace from retail weakness, leading to higher-than-expected promotional activity. This could be attributed to the competitive landscape, where there are emerging competitors that are growing at a faster rate than Nike, particularly Decker's Outdoors, DEC, that is expected to grow in low to mid-teens over the next few years compared to low to mid single digit growth projections for Nike. Furthermore, as Elliot Hill joined as the new president and CEO starting last month, the company has withdrawn its previous guidance. As opposed to its previous guidance, where it expected revenue to decline in the mid single digits for the full year FY25, the management provided non-specific commentary where it now expects a slight second half improvement in revenue trends compared to their first half as they introduce and scale newness and innovation across the marketplace. Specifically for Q2, Nike now expects revenues to decline in the 8 to 10% range, which could indicate some degree of bottoming. While gross margins are expected to decline 150 basis points from higher promotions, channel mix headwinds and supply chain deleverage, along with flat year-over-year SG&A expenses, it should be noted that it is not uncommon for new management to scrap old guidance and start with a clean slate, especially given his 32-year track record with Nike in leading global teams and delivering growth. However, given the slew of downward revisions to revenue and earnings over the three months, investor sentiment will likely remain dampened for quite some time, the good newness and innovation driving pockets of strength in performance. In my previous post, I had discussed the company's strategic priority to reposition in performance sport with a superior focus on innovation. During the earnings call, the management further noted that they are seeing clear indications of progress in accelerating newness and innovation, with revenue from new footwear products up strong double digits compared to the previous year. For example, in the performance franchise, Sabrina has grown 5x, Kobe has quadrupled, and AlphaFly has almost tripled, while the company's two largest performance franchises, Mercurial and Global Football, and the GT Series in Basketball also grew double digits across all channels. Plus, the management also elaborated further, saying that they are seeing growth in multiple sport dimensions, 
led by men's fitness, men's global football, and men's and women's running footwear. Particularly, they are encouraged by the momentum building in their running category, with men's and women's running footwear delivering positive growth in Q1, with North America up double digits this quarter, with strong order books indicating growing consumer engagement and brand momentum as they launch Pegasus 41, which will be accompanied by Peg Trail, Peg Plus, and Peg Premium as they scale the franchise in the coming seasons. As the management expects newness and innovation to take a significant step forward in their total footwear mix, helping the segment to grow sequentially and on a year-over-year -year basis, it is also investing across marketing and partners to display bolder storytelling that resonates with its audience and expand its footprint with partnerships with companies such as Dick's Sporting Goods, Foot Locker, FL, and more. Revisiting my valuation. Downside is limited. Taking the current consensus analyst estimates into consideration, Nike is expected to see its revenues decline over 7% in FY25, which is more or less in alignment with the management's commentary on expecting to see a slight recovery in the second half of the fiscal year, as they see a higher contribution from newer and innovative products driving growth across channels and geographies. While headwinds from their ongoing portfolio optimization will minimize, Assuming Nike is able to start growing in the mid-single digits starting next year, as the new management doubles down on performance sports, it should see a total revenue of approximately $52.8 billion by FY27. From a profitability standpoint, taking the consensus estimates for non-GAAP EPS of $2.74 in FY27, we can see that it will be growing more than double the rate of revenue growth which I believe will be made possible by a combination of the management's investments in, in demand creation and product innovation, yielding results in the form of higher ASPs, average selling prices, and units sold across channels and geographies, leading to higher operating leverage and expanding profitability. This will be equivalent to a present value of $3.21 in non-GAAP EPS when discounted at 8%. Taking the S&P 500 as a proxy, where its companies grow their earnings on average by 8% over a 10-year period, with a price-to-earnings ratio of 15 to 18, I believe that Nike should be trading at 1.5 times the multiple, given the growth rate of its earnings during this period of time. This will translate to a P.E. ratio of 25, or a price target of $80, which is roughly 2% higher than where the stock is currently trading at. My final verdict and conclusions. There is no doubt that Nike is yet to get its footing back. With John Donahue retiring and Elliot Hill transitioning to the CEO position, there is a lot of uncertainty with the company's growth trajectory ahead. Although the Q1 FY25 earnings report was not encouraging at a high level, I believe that there are some early signs of hope arising when it comes to the newness and innovation in performance sports, where certain sports categories and franchises are significantly outperforming. While the outperformance from pockets in performance sports is not enough to offset the weakness from unit sales and portfolio optimization in the short run, amid a backdrop of macroeconomic uncertainty and growing competitive threats, I believe the company will should easier comps moving forward, especially if it sticks to its long-term plan of doubling down on innovation in performance sports while investing in powerful brand narratives and strategic partnerships to expand retail presence. Assessing both the good and the bad, I believe that while the new CEO has a massive task ahead to turn the fate of the company around, the downside risk of the stock may have minimized since my previous sell rating. As a result, I will upgrade the stock to a hold rating with a price target of $80. And there you guys have it. That is the hold article. A little bit less in depth when it comes to the numbers. I do prefer the buy one article because it, it shows a little bit more graphs, which is something I do like. But in general, it's okay. I want to give now my two cents when it comes to this. I'm not going to go full in depth as I did last time, but I would like to go in a little bit further. For starters, looking at this overall graph on the one year, this thing is down 30.63%. Year to date, it is down 30.11%, very near that 52-week low. 
$70.75 to a high of $123.39. Overall peak, as y'all heard in the article, was around like $180 or so. And uh, yeah, it's been, even in the past five years, it's down 15.5%. On the 10 years, actually, when it's up almost 60%. But you can see that it is back down to very, very near the same lows as um, COVID lows. So if you like this company during COVID lows and you wanted it to go back to COVID lows back around this point over here in 2021, should, shouldn't be complaining at this time, right? You should not be complaining at this time at all. Now, when looking at the earnings, this is something that is a little bit scary because especially in the second article with the hold, it does go into a little bit more of like, hey, management is dealing with all of this. There's a lot of issues when it comes to this. We have a new CEO. Uh, you know, It's just a bunch of stuff. So we can see that when it comes to earnings, they have been beating earnings at least this past time on October 1st. Beating earnings EPS by 17 cents and then EPS gap of 18 cents. But again, earnings EPS can be manipulated by buying back shares. Revenue, on the other hand, you can see that it was a mess by 56.39 billion. And the next revision on um, and the next earnings, which is on December 20th, well, you guys can see that it has 20 revisions to the downside, all of them to the downside. So that's a little bit concerning right there. And when looking at the dividend, we can see that they do pay out the dividend as near 2%. So even though the stock price is near that 52 week low, we can see that it's not really a big yield, nothing like three or three and a half percent, but 2% with an annual payout of $1.48, a payout ratio of 39.78 with a five year CAGR of 10.96% with 11 consecutive years of dividend payment. And going back in the past 10 years, we can see that they have not cut it at all. And if we take a look at the max, even during the 2007, 2008 crash, I mean, they had a stock split, but they never really cut their dividend at all. In fact, they've never cut their dividend ever, ever, actually. They've kept it the same back in like the 2000s and like the 1998, 1999, but there has been no cuts at all. And now looking at the spreadsheet, when it comes to the last year's payout ratio in regards to the free cash flow, we can see that it is 33.35%, which is really good. And in the past 10 years, free cash flow is 54.21. So yes, they can afford this dividend. And looking at the overall fundamentals, we did hear in the first article that had it as a buy that, well, the fundamentals are really good, right? They have solid fundamentals. They have a really good moat. And looking at the net income, we could see that, right? There's only been two years here where this thing actually, well, technically three, uh, three years here where they actually fell from eight to seven years ago, and then from six to five, and then from three to two. Overall, though, I'm going to give this a 75% when it comes to the net income. The free castle does look a little bit better. Once again, five years ago, it did fall, and then from four to three, it fell again, and then from 10 to nine, it fell again. Overall, though, I'm going to give this an 80%. It is heading in a nice upwards direction. While the revenue quarter over quarter is coming down, the revenue year over year is showing a lot of prominence in fact looking at the trailing 12 months when it comes to this revenue we can see that it is at 50 billion dollars now this is a little bit off from last year's uh may 2024 because they are a year ahead they end their fiscal year in, in may we can see that we are off by around a billion dollars or so but Again, they end in May. So we still have an entire quarter into 2025, calendar year 2025, not fiscal 2025, uh, for this to actually count. So we, we might get a slight beat when it comes to the trailing 12 months for 2025. Maybe a beat, slight beat, or exactly or roughly around the same margin revenue as it did in May of 2024. So due to the fact that we don't necessarily know exactly where this is heading, I'm going to give this as 100% because in the past 10 years, this has been very consistently increasing, all except for the five-year goal value. And by the way, for all of those of you asking, yeah, the five-year goal was 2020. You're like, it was, you know, the pandemic low was March 2020. And just so happened that they end their fiscal year in May of 2020. So that explains as to why that's occurring right there. And when it comes to the assets minus liabilities, it's been kind of staggering ever since four years ago. Uh, overall, though, average assets minus average total liabilities is $12.25 billion. I'll give it a 60%. In terms of the cash flow minus liabilities, I did point this out that, yes, this is slightly increasing ever since the low of five-year-ago value. Overall, I'm going to give this a 70%. As of one year ago, it is negative $17.1 billion, and the average being negative $13.61 billion. 
And the one grab that they really have down, it is their shares outstanding. This is looking absolutely perfect. They've been buying back for the past 10 years at a rate of almost 13%. Previously to the current year, a buyback of 0.8, going from 1.7 billion shares 10 years ago to today of 1.49 billion shares. Easy, 100%. And when it comes to the cash on hand as of the trailing, they have 8.5 billion and the average being $6.55 billion. Now, this is actually resulting in a grade of 83%. And if you guys remember what I gave it last time, in fact, here is the screenshot. I gave it an 84%. So you guys can see that I didn't consult that video at all. I just did it again and I'm getting roughly the same. So an 83%, 84%, a solid B, B minus. It's, it's a pretty decent company from a fundamental perspective, which I do agree with the article on that one. So right off the bat, this is not looking like too bad of a buy fundamentally. Now, looking at the discounted free cash flow, we already got that on the buy article. It calls for about $111. Meanwhile, the hold article says $80. Now, I'm going to be using the same kind of CAGR that you guys saw on the buy one. And let's see what kind of numbers we get. Now, for the average 10-year revenue, you can see that it's been around 6.13% in the past 10 years. I'm going to go 5, 6, and 7% for the next upcoming 10 years, low, median, high assumption. For the predicted share buyback, roughly the same at 0, 1, and then 2%. Basically, my aim is for that median assumption. And you guys can see I do have the 12%, but I do want to change that to 10% because I I don't want to put it at 9. I think that's a little bit low. I want to put that 10 just to match. Let's put that 10 first and then let's see 9. And then let's see which numbers we get from that. So at 10%, we could see that the stock now is $50.64 to $72.37. Not adjusting for debt and adjusting for debt $55.10 to $77.83. With a margin of safety of 5, 10, 15, 46, 83 to 73, 94. So yeah, this is more leaning towards that hold one, like the, the same kind of price tag that the hold article talked about. However, let's put this to nine, which is what the basically what the uh, previous article or what the buy article said. So let's put this at nine and we can see that it is at $90 on the highest assumption adjusting for debt, 75.48 to $90. So it's, it's an interesting because, well, if it does do that 10%, then this is essentially in line, at least the current price. It is in line with, um, with valuation, according to me. And uh, at 9%, it is very well undervalued. So I look at this and I find it very, very interesting. Tell me what you guys think in the comment section below about, well, all three of us, right? The buy articles um, price tag, the hold articles price tag, and my price tag, which I'm going to say it roughly at around between 75 to 90 dollars, let's say around 80 to 85 dollars, um, basically, right? Let's just keep it around that time frame. Let's just keep it around that range. I like to give ranges, not exact numbers. So 75 and 90 dollars, I would say, would be a pretty good buying price to be at value. So now let's actually go back to this dividend because I am tempted to buy 100 shares tomorrow. Now at the current share price, guys, of, well, this will probably be a little bit higher. It'll be, by the time the market opens, this will probably be around $78. Basically, 100 shares would be $7,800. And with 100 shares, that will, the yield will be a little bit lower, but I think it'll still be around that 1.9. That would essentially get me, guys, per year, $148. That would essentially get me $148 per year. And on a quarterly basis, because they do pay their dividends quarterly, you divide that by four, you get $37 every single quarter. Now, one more thing that I do want to mention is in regards to their options chains, because if I do buy 100 shares, I plan to sell covered calls on this at a much higher price tag, especially when IV is really, really high during CPI, during earnings, that kind of stuff, just to get a little bit more premium. You know, get the premium. And this is one stock, guys, that I'm not really, I guess, afraid to lose the dividend. Honestly, I'm really not. It's not a lot to begin with, right? $37 every quarter. So this would just be one that's similar to Broadcom in a way where I would just buy the 100 shares, continue selling cover calls at a much higher price tag. And then if it goes in the money, then it goes in the money. So be it. But the option shades look really, really interesting in the sense that 
for well for like let's say next month at around december 20th we can see that they do have a lot of good premiums here um for like for like 92 dollars and 50 cents 18 bucks 90 dollars 27 bucks and again you subtract that difference 90 minus 78 gives you around what is that 22 dollars or yeah 90 minus 78 is around seven, uh, you know 22 dollars multiply by 100 that's two thousand two hundred dollars profit uh which it's a pretty decent profit right just from a capital gains perspective it will be short term unfortunately but it's still looking very good for a short term capital gains so this is my two cents when it comes to this what do you guys think about this kind of video format looking at you know a couple articles here and there yes it would make the videos a little bit longer but you guys could just either double speed it or skip it right i have seeking alpha i i pay for it I'm willing to give you guys a video showing a little bit of articles that some of you may not even be able to read because you don't have Seeking Alpha. So more than happy to do that for all of you guys. And let me know in the comment section what y'all think. But thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment. It really does help here on YouTube as well. So make sure to follow us on XFL Investing. If you'd like to join us on the Discord, which is the best way to catch these videos, live streams, and shorts. Link is in the description below for that one. So with that said, peace out, and we'll see you all next time.